The million dollar question, how do you make this from scratch lifestyle work when time is limited, money is limited, and you're drawing a blank as to what to even make? Over the last decade since our own health journey led us down this real food path, I've asked all of these questions. I have poured the last decade of my life into troubleshooting these problems and coming up with systems that work. Come join us and see what a whole week's worth of meals looks like and how we make this lifestyle work for our family. Even before the week begins, if at all possible, I try to do a few things on the weekend to set us up well for meals the following week. The first thing is that I thaw meat. I don't always have a plan for the meat that I pull out, but I'll pull out at least three or four different cuts of meat that we'll have throughout the coming week. This week I took out a whole chicken, two pounds of ground beef, and a beef round roast to thaw. I'm not a strict meal planner, but I also don't completely fly by the seat of my pants. When it comes to meals, I like to head into the week with a rough plan of a few meals that I know that we'll have, and then just figure it out from there based on what we have that needs to be used and how the week is shaping up so that nothing goes to waste. I also like to prep a couple quick things on the weekend ahead of time if I can. So yesterday I cooked and pureed a couple of butternut squash and then I baked a bunch of baked potatoes. This way I'll have a few easy things on hand and ready to go. Before bed last night I got a whole chicken slow cooking. And I've talked about this before but it's been revolutionary for us so I'll say it again. I always add the water and a splash of apple cider vinegar for making broth directly to the Dutch oven or crock pot with the whole chicken cooking. This leads to a way more flavorful and nutritious broth than you get if you just make it by adding water to the carcass after the chicken has been cooked. Our typical morning routine is chores and breakfast, followed by doing a violin practice with our kids and then our homeschool routine. We typically wrap up by 11-ish, so we rely heavily on slow cooked meals that require very little actual hands-on time, especially during these full mornings. When we finished up, I pull the chicken out of the oven and ladle the broth out into jars for meals later in the week. I get the already cooked baked potatoes warming up and then just pop the chicken back into the oven for a few more minutes to broil and get that nice crispy skin. And voila, in 10 or 15 minutes, we have chicken and baked potatoes ready for lunch. Almost every Monday, we have a whole chicken. I really love this routine because when Monday rolls around, I don't have to think about it. I just know what we're having. And then I always pull the remaining meat off the chicken, and that one chicken, that's usually around five to six pounds, so a larger chicken, will serve us for at least three, if not four meals. Oftentimes, with how our life and schedule works with homeschooling and Jim and I both working from home, we've found that lunch often tends to be our bigger meal of the day, and then dinner is often a lighter meal or something that's more thrown together or leftovers. There's also research that shows eating a larger portion of your calories earlier in the day and then less in the evening can be helpful for blood sugar regulation, metabolic health, and weight management. So that's another incentive to eat this way. The afternoons are when our kids have a quiet time or nap time and then can play a game or play outside or work on a project until dinner time. During this time, Jim and I are either getting work done for our business or outside or I'm getting ahead with some meal prep. Since it's the beginning of the week, I'm going to meal prep some butternut squash chili that we'll have for lunch tomorrow. I love making soups a day in advance if I can because they're one of those things that just gets better after a day or two to let them sit and let all those flavors meld together. I'll post the recipes to everything that I'm making below, but this is a great soup because it uses so many of the foods that we have grown and stored away. 
I love the sweetness and creaminess that pureed butternut squash adds to chili, so I'm throwing in a full quart of squash along with two pounds of ground beef, some leftover soaked and cooked black beans, onion, garlic, and I also like to add sweet potatoes or carrots. Really whatever you have on hand works in this recipe. There are several things, mainly dairy recipes like yogurt, sour cream, and cheese that we tend to make every week that are staples in so many of our meals. Because we've made these things so many times, I can just throw them together whenever I get a few minutes of margin time. Today I need to make a quick batch of sour cream because we almost finished ours with the baked potatoes that we had for lunch. Oh, <laughs> Come on. There we go. To make sour cream, I just mix a pint of raw cream with two tablespoons of yogurt and then heat it in a jar until it hits about 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I wrap it with towels to keep it warm and let it sit overnight and then in the morning we should have nice, thick, creamy sour cream for our chili tomorrow. For dinner tonight, I had a serving or two of leftover pork roast from the weekend that needed to get eaten. So I'm going to make our favorite easy weeknight pizza to put that on. The pizza crust for this is so simple. It's just flour with baking powder and salt mixed with yogurt. It sounds a little strange, but it works really well and it comes together to make a nice, soft, pick upable crust. I'm just using a soft white wheat flour that we had ground up earlier, but you could use einkorn or an all-purpose gluten-free flour in this recipe too. Instead of using our standard tomato sauce, I'm going to add some Worcestershire, garlic, mustard, maple syrup, and some apple cider vinegar to make a tomato-based barbecue sauce to go with that pork. Then we'll top it with our mozzarella and farmhouse cheddar cheeses. What do you see out there? Rain? Lots and lots of rain. First thing on Tuesday, I pull out the Dutch oven of chili and get that slow cooking. Along with cast iron pans, our Dutch ovens are our other favorite cookware. I have two Le Creuset Dutch ovens. One is 6.75 quarts and the other is 9 quarts and we use them both all the time. I got one for Christmas and the other one I found off of Facebook Marketplace and hopefully both will last well beyond my lifetime. <laughs> finish our mornings, our crew is always ready for lunch and our one-year-old is ready for a nap, so I love the days that lunch is ready and waiting for us when we wrap up. Just ready for some chili. Let me set this down. This chili is so hearty and delicious that it definitely feels like a filling meal in itself without needing to add anything else. About an hour before getting dinner ready today, I'm gonna throw together another make-ahead meal to reheat for lunch tomorrow. This is gonna be a little bit of an experiment. Cheesy chicken, broccoli, and rice casserole is one of our favorites, but I'm gonna do a variation on that with swapping Brussels sprouts for the broccoli since we just harvested a bunch from our garden, and then I'm gonna chop up our round roast and use that instead of chicken. So it's gonna be more of a cheesy beef and Brussels sprout casserole with rice. 
To make this one, I make a roux by melting fat in the pan, cooking the garlic and onions, and I'm going to use tapioca starch instead of flour as a thickener, so I add that in. Then I add in broth and let the mixture heat up and thicken before adding milk and spices, and then add in the Brussels sprouts, rice, and beef. I'm going to toss this in the oven to let the rice cook, and then once it's cooked, I'll put it in the refrigerator, and tomorrow all we'll need to do is reheat it and melt the cheese before serving. For most of the recipes we make, especially ones like soups and casseroles, which make up a lot of our meals, I always scale them so that they'll feed our family for at least two meals, which really cuts down on time spent cooking. I also really appreciate how these types of slow cooked meals are easy to incorporate so many cuts of meat into. A great way to save money and add more nutrition to meals is by eating nose to tail. We get all of our meat by the whole or half animal. And so for this casserole, I used a round roast, which is a very lean cut of beef that's best when slow cooked. Cooking through the whole animal has really given us so much more appreciation for the cuts that we previously had never tried, and now they're some of our favorites. We're a little rushed at dinner time tonight because our daughter has ballet at five, so we try to sit down and eat by four o'clock. This is another reason that I like to do a bigger meal earlier in the day and then something a little bit lighter for dinner. Can you bring this to the table? We often do sandwiches on Tuesday nights, which is what we're having tonight. Once a month, we do a batch sourdough cooking session where we'll freeze a few loaves of sourdough bread for using throughout the month. So we don't do bread often, but it's enough to be able to have a sandwich once a week or so. After lunch, I took out the sourdough bread and mozzarella to thaw, and then we'll use some of our leftover chicken from yesterday and mashed avocado to make grilled cheese with chicken and avocado, or our kids just like to have grilled cheese and then their chicken and avocado on the side. Thank you, Mommy! You're welcome, Betty. Along with the sandwiches, we're having apple slices that they can have a scoop of peanut butter with if they want it. Ma! Yeah. Ah! Oh, are you so excited? Ma! I'm so hungry. It was the wall before you had. Wednesday morning, I get the creamy beef and Brussels sprout casserole with rice, warming up while we jump into our morning routine. The only thing I'll need to do with this one is sprinkle some cheese over the top to melt before serving. This was our first time making this combination and it was a big hit. We still love cheesy chicken broccoli rice casserole, but this recipe is so versatile to use whatever meat or veggies you happen to have on hand. I tend to do more of our bulk cooking the first half of the week, so by the time we get to the end of the week, we're mainly relying on leftovers. How much do you want? One scoop or two? Two! I want two and a half. I want one scoop. I love two and a half. Okay, I'll give you two and a half. Two and a half. Dinner is going to be a baked potato bar using the rest of the baked potatoes that I had made at the beginning of the week. We also had some leftover bacon and pulled pork from the weekend that need to get used up, so we're having those alongside other baked potato staples like butter, cheese, and sour cream. Baked potato? You said 
see if it can do I've mentioned this tip before with rice, but it's true with potatoes as well. When you cook potatoes and then cool them down, it significantly lowers the glycemic index of the potato. In the cooling process, essentially the structure of the potato or rice changes, increasing the amount of resistant starch, a type of starch that is not as easily digestible by the body, causing a much slower blood sugar spike when eaten. That's why things like rice and potatoes are great to make in advance and then reheat when you're ready to eat them. It's snowing at last. Mommy, do you, do you see that snow on the wood thing? Mm -hmm. It was a little tough getting everyone to sit through dinner tonight because we were getting our very first little snowfall of the year. So the kids were super excited to get outside so they scarfed down their potatoes so they could go run and play. Put on a hat, whatever hat you see. Or put the hood on on your jacket. Put the hood on on your jacket. Clara fell off a few times. Now that it's Thursday, we're starting to do more meals that are leftovers of things that I had made earlier in the week. So lunch is gonna be the second half of the butternut squash chili that we had on Tuesday. We ended up getting a couple inches of snow overnight and this morning, so the kids were super excited to play outside before lunch, and chili was the perfect meal to warm up to afterwards. As much as possible, I try to space leftovers out a bit so that we're not having the same thing twice in back-to-back -back days, but we'll try to do more of an every other day sort of thing. Also, if possible, I try to make it so we aren't eating the same type of meat twice in one day. So if it's beef chili for lunch, we're having something with chicken or pork for dinner. For dinner, I'm gonna use the rest of the leftover chicken to make a creamy chicken and potato soup, or what we normally call chicken pot pie soup. It tastes very similar to the filling of a chicken pot pie, but I add extra broth to make it more of a soup consistency. I find that it stretches farther as a soup than as thick chicken pot pie. The hardest and most time consuming part of making soups is chopping the vegetables. I always try to get all my veggies chopped first and then it only takes a few minutes for the soup to come together. This creamy chicken soup also involves making a roux. So after I get the onions and the garlic sauteed in fat, I'm gonna add in some tapioca starch as the thickener and mix that in before adding chicken broth. This soup will finish up the three quarts of chicken broth that we made at the beginning of the week when we slow cooked our chicken. Once that mixture starts to thicken, I reduce the heat to a simmer and add in the potatoes and carrots. The quickest way to get those potatoes and carrots cooked is to put a lid on them and then just let them simmer on low for about 20 to 30 minutes. I like to check on them every few minutes just to give them a stir and make sure everything's looking okay. After the potatoes and carrots are soft, I add in everything else. So the chicken, cream, salt, and Italian seasonings, and I'm also adding in some dried nettle that we had preserved this spring for some added color and nutrition. While the soup is cooking, I'm going to make these really easy yogurt drop biscuits to go with it to make it more similar to a chicken pot pie. I like a good, flaky, mile-high biscuit, but I also like quick and simple and to use basic, nutritious ingredients that we always have on hand. So when I want a quick biscuit to go with some soup, I love to make these easy four-ingredient yogurt biscuits. They're actually the same ingredients that I use in that pizza crust that we made on Monday. So it's just flour, 
baking powder, salt, and yogurt. They may not get quite as tall and flaky as a standard biscuit. They're a little bit denser, but they're still really delicious and pair perfectly with this soup. A great option for a weeknight meal. To make these, just mix your flour, baking powder, and salt together in a bowl, and then mix in the yogurt. If you're using a thicker Greek style yogurt, you don't need to use as much flour. But with our standard homemade yogurt that's not quite as thick as Greek yogurt, I like to add just a little bit of extra flour to the dough to make it a bit stiffer so they look more like a biscuit and less like a flatbread. My favorite way to cook them is on a cast iron pan. So I had this cast iron pan preheating in the oven, slightly greased so that the biscuits won't stick to them. And that's the trick with cast iron. When you heat it up, it closes the pores in the cast iron so things don't stick to it. These biscuits don't rise a ton when baking, so I try to form them into little mounds as much as possible when I spoon them onto the pan. Then you just bake them at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 18 minutes. We are always up and out the door early on Fridays for our kids' violin lessons and often use this opportunity while we're out to run other errands, meet up with friends, or go for a hike in the morning. So this is another day where the slow cooker is my best friend. We'll be having the leftover beef and Brussels sprout casserole with rice from earlier in the week. So I'm just gonna put that in our slow cooking oven that's at 200 degrees and let this heat up while we're gone so that when we get back, lunch will be hot and ready. Boom. Our Friday evening meal is a hodgepodge. We have one kid that's at a sleepover at grandma and grandpa's, and then our oldest daughter and I are going to a women's event at our church, so we're just pulling together some leftovers and whatever we can scrounge up for a quick and easy dinner for those that need something. There's a couple of leftover pieces of pizza and baked potatoes with a little bit of leftover chili from earlier in the week, and if we need anything else, I can always cook up some eggs and fry up some potatoes or sweet potatoes. So that's a peek into our meals on a pretty standard week for us. And just to touch on a few other things that may be helpful. So weekends are always dependent on what we have going on. This weekend we'll have the leftover chicken pot pie soup for lunch on Saturday. And then Jim and I actually get to go out on a date Saturday night while his parents come and hang out with our kids. So I'll probably make some sort of pasta dish with shrimp for them to have, which is somewhat of a rare treat in our house, but one that our kids really love. Seafood is one thing that I haven't mentioned here, and it's because we don't eat it very often. We all really enjoy it, and it can be so nutritious, but it's not something that I've found a great source for. So if you have any good seafood recommendations, I'd love to hear. On Sundays, it's our family's tradition to have our sourdough deep dish pizza for lunch after church. We make a whole bunch of these deep dish pizza crusts in our monthly sourdough session, and then all I need to do is thaw them, and then on Sunday morning, I set them out to rise, and when we get home, it's really easy to spread out the crust on a pan, top it, and then we have pizza ready in under 30 minutes. How many eggs am I making? Yeah, I want the rest of them. Pan. Just gonna do a scramble. Another thing that I didn't talk about here is breakfast, and that's honestly because we've been having variations of the same thing every day lately, and that's eggs. I like to add a little bit of liver pate to our eggs and top it with some sauerkraut for extra nutrients, and then we'll have that with yogurt, maybe a date or a little applesauce. In different seasons, I have more capacity to make some other fun breakfast recipes like baked oatmeal or homemade sausage patties, but right now we're just in the middle of wrapping up some projects and we have a lot on our plate, so eggs it is. It's also great that our eight-year-old enjoys making eggs for her siblings, so that's a huge help in the mornings. Our meals aren't fancy or elaborate. They're simple, nutritious, 
economical, but we always feel like we're eating so, so good.